I'm pretty sure that almost everybody considers NS Lobby to be somewhere near the top of the tier list in terms of quality, slightly above Arlong Park, Alabasta, and Skypea, and that makes sense with them being the climax for their respective sagas. But I think all four of these have managed to mark a turning point for the story as a whole. Arlong Park is establishing the weight that Luffy would put on themselves in order to help others, making other people's problems fully his, while also being the first time that the Straw Hats get their first ever bounty. Alabasta, on the other hand, is the first time that the Straw Hats have ever headed out of the tutorial zone, that is, East Blue, along with the challenges that come with that. Not only does it deal with Luffy defeating one of the Big Seven, but also officially marking them as an opposing force to the world government. Skypea takes a similar approach, but instead of the Straw Hats fighting against pirates, the whole crew is instead fighting this like self-proclaimed god. And kind of shows that no matter where you try to go, there will always be some looming threat not too far ahead. Which is what finally brings us to Enna's Lobby, which is what takes the next big step. If Alabasta showed us that the Straw Hats were a potential threat to the world government, then Enna's Lobby fully turns them into a real threat against the world government. Not just putting them on the grid, but putting them right in the center of it. With them not being reactionary to a larger enemy as a whole, like in Skypea, but instead the Straw Hats are actually taking an actionary position. They're the ones taking charge. They dictate the pace of the battle since now it's the world's government turn to play defensively which is really fascinating to watch as we're seeing them being extremely active in what's essentially a, a straightforward shot to Robin with obstacles in the way. Of course, in order to even take an actionary position, they have to reevaluate themselves in an attempt to overcome uh, the major hurdle that Water 7 had finally put in front of them. That in order to rescue any crew members, they have to actually be a crew. Water 7 was practically the collapse of the crew as they slowly over the course of the arc realized how unstable their foundation truly was. It showed how impossible it was for them to recognize Luffy as a true captain and how much Luffy themselves needed to grow as one. How much they were not taking things seriously and how they struggled to stick together through difficult situations. Truly putting into question not just whether or not the crew was falling apart but whether it was even truly a crew to begin with. Throughout the entire arc, there were a ton of questions. Is Robin even part of the crew? If she is, then what are we going to do? If she's not, also what are we going to do? Are we even going to stick together? And so forth. And there's no protocol yet. There's no hierarchy. There's not any respect. So it has been building question after question to finally reach the second half of the saga, Ennis Lobby, where all of those questions are finally put to rest. Yes, she is part of the crew. Yes, we are going after her. Yes, the Straw Hats will do this together, even if it means putting like personal issues on hold so that the entirety of the crew can manage. Before I even began to read this, I had a checklist of stuff that I thought was going to pan out during this arc. And it's interesting to me just how utterly wrong I got everything. For example, I thought Nami would fight the assistant and that like Long Nose would fight Long Nose and I guess I technically got that right depending on how much leeway you want to give me. I also thought that everybody in the crew needed a power up in order to be able to defeat the main enemies of this arc. And what's interesting is that sure, that is also technically correct. But it's easy to guess the big picture stuff. I knew that they would get Robin back. I didn't expect them not to. But the actual difficulty and the surprise of it all is that despite all of that, the actual specifics are anyone's guess. All the intrigue and strangeness and heartbreaking moments are all in the execution. What can I even say about Robin's backstory? There were, there were no punches pulled back in Robin's backstory. To say that Robin had it tough would be to undermine just the societal issues that have gotten her to this point. Her life doesn't even start good and get bad. It just starts bad and then maybe gets a little bit better, but just kidding, it's still bad. Her mother left out of the broader, bigger complications of the world government with her mother hunting down an even bigger mystery of the void century. Meanwhile, her adopted family considers her a burden and the rest of the village is full of kids who either dislike her or parents who distrust her for using her devil fruit abilities. I think that like what really puts this over the top is not just that it's a tragic backstory, but that there's always a glimmer of hope. At the start, 
Robin does actually have someone who she could befriend and trust. They are the archaeologist in the Tree of Knowledge. They are so happy to see her become an archaeologist, which sort of creates this like safe zone from the external world where she can feel accepted. Whether this is because her mother was an archaeologist and she wants to become one, or because the archaeologists were like one of the few people who may have been knowledgeable enough and well-versed in devil fruits, which allows them to like more easily sympathize with her. Or whether it was just her way of creating escapism by like diving into the past so that she wouldn't feel hurt from the betrayals of the present. I think the story at this point has reinforced the idea that nothing itself is bad. Frankie and Mr. Tom reiterate this ideology back in Water 7 that merely existing is not a sin. And it's further recontextualized here. Archaeology and the exploration of the Void's entry within itself was never a problem. But it's fascinating to see how the world government reacts upon uh, discovering that the archaeologists at this point know too much. It shows that, like, information is valuable. Valuable enough to be destroyed and hidden from the rest of the world, and equally valuable enough to be encrypted and spread throughout the world in the form of poneglyphs. But it also shows the weirdness of the world government, how they seem to have a close connection with the Void Sentry, with the poneglyphs, perhaps the ancient weapons like Pluton, and whatever else they're trying to cover up. But whatever it is, it's apparently worth protecting so much that you're willing to destroy an entire island off the grid in order to cover it up. Saul told her that it was like way too dangerous to even talk about this, as well as a bunch of Ohara archaeologists. So you are truly getting into some stuff. I love that the story structure here has been uh, equally as compact as Water 7. We're also getting like multiple things happening at once. We're building the history of Ohara and the archaeologist's role in the world, as well as their connection to Robin. We are learning about Sol and the fact that there are giants outside of Albath and giants in the Navy, while also connecting his hopeful optimism to one of Robin's low points. I think it's interesting that not even the Navy are fully aware of the effects of the Buster Call. They think they know what a Buster Call is, but they, they don't. And look, sure, we can talk about how even the main antagonist is willing to summon a Buster Call without really knowing what it entails, but I can chop that up to incompetence. But even the admirals in O'Hara also don't know what a Buster Call entails. They think they're going to be fine once they summon a Buster Call. But as we see, when they mean that it destroys everything, they mean everything. And because all of this occurred due to the knowledge that archaeologists have, it makes sense that they don't want Robin to be associated with archaeologists. Not only does it create rejection from the only community that Robin has ever been a part of, but it also denies them their own existence when their mother chooses to ignore Robin and Robin's own well-being. And while they do later get a second to share a genuine moment with one another through the worst situation that either of them could have probably experienced, that moment is quickly undercut by the severity of the situation. From the Navy's perspective, clearing O'Hara is what they need to do. To some of them, they don't care about the moral implications. Some of them judge O'Hara as a place that was deemed to be destroyed. Some of them feel empathetic but draw the line at different places. We see some people in the Navy just destroy refugee ships while others make exceptions and even fewer abandon the whole thing out of principle. The concept of justice here seems to be carried out by just unquestionable authority. You do it simply because you're told. That's the conflict Smoker and Toshigi began to question all the way back in Alabasta. That's the one that Saul began to question entering Ohara, and that's the one that Okiji seems to have ran into. The tears are flowing, okay? We got enough water from my tears to hydrate Alabasta. Robin's situation was truly terrible. She has the last link in her community stripped away, and the only place that she could resign to is one that seemingly doesn't accept her. She was branded as a demon within her community and then by the outside world. She's branded a demon and has a high bounty and she's still a child at this point. And so you can feel the nihilism building up. Everywhere she goes, there's this pattern of finding trust and acceptance only for it to be denied moments later. The Marines are always after her and so everyone eventually either sees her as a high bounty or a thing that'll just get them all killed. So she moves to like more dangerous people in the hopes of finding safety. 
Some low-level pirates can't provide safety, but Crocodile seemingly becomes a shield, even if Robin's value is only seen in Robin's ability to find Pluton. It isn't until the Straw Hats arrive where she is truly cared after, where she realizes that living and being content are even an option. So of course there's like a juxtaposition between her attempting to maintain her morality and choosing to save Luffy in Alabasta versus the seemingly evil scheming nature of staying with Crocodile and being branded as a villain. She wasn't really in a position to choose how people perceived her. Up to this point, living and surviving was not a guarantee, and her just running away was practically a fatal attempt at self-preservation. Saul told her to find people who would eventually enjoy her presence, but after like 20 years of being constantly betrayed by practically everyone you know, you start to lose some hope and have already predicted what might happen with the current crew you're in. But that, that is why in this lobby hit so strongly. Despite all of that, the Straw Hats are well aware of the consequences and they don't back down, but head even deeper into trouble for Robin. And of course, that brings us finally to Ennis Lobby. Seriously, what, what is this place? Ennis Lobby is like showcasing a glimpse of all of the weirdness that the world government has in store. We've seen a glimpse of a few things that they could do, like control the weather. We saw that back in Alabasta. But here, it's not just the weather, but the full-on lunar cycles. Why is it always daytime? Why is it called the Nightless Island? And how does that even work? How are the marines able to enter when it's surrounded by Neptunians? Neptunians? Do they just have, like, Neptunian repellent? What are those bigger-than-life gates that nobody explained? They have the world government symbol, so presumably they're not like a Lovecraftian concept. But I don't think that helps answer their strange presence. What about, like, the void that all of the water flows into? Not to mention the floating island. And it's not just like a floating island like in Skypea where it's surrounded by clouds, but it is a literal floating island hovering by itself. See what I mean? It's strange to even see what kind of technology they have. How they somehow have managed to access devil fruits made by stealing them from pirates who found them. But then again... How are they able to put those devil fruits into inanimate objects? Let's talk about them breaking into NS Lobby. It is so in character that as soon as they arrive to this island, Luffy immediately goes on ahead to cause mayhem. I think at this point there's an established connection between Luffy and Zoro where Luffy doesn't have practical leadership skills, but they're willing to rely on Zoro for that. So there's this nice dynamic where Zoro is fine being the right-hand man who usually takes the charge. Even the Frankie family says, I thought Zoro was the captain because he's practically leading the charge. So Luffy's role here is usually to overextend and go towards the big bad while Zoro acts more of uh, an anchor which takes control while Luffy's not there. It is probably my favorite crew dynamic because it truly feels like a pirate crew dynamic. It is the captain and the first mate, both of them knowing the rules and naturally go into them when they have to. Also, the cavalry that backs them up. I knew the Frankie family was going to burst in there, but I didn't think the seahorses would be able to ride on land. But they uh, seem to have no problem with it. The seahorses are so important that they have like their own mini arc to go along with it, having like their own intentions of uh, getting back Frankie. It is actually ridiculous how far this goes. One of the seahorses, I actually don't know which one's which, is all beaten up and yet they promise to take everyone on their back over to Frankie. So when they're confronted with a dead end, they're willing to just bash themselves into a wall to open it. Only to have like Zoro and Sanji, who are almost always clashing with each other, finally get serious when they need to, and immediately back up the seahorse in order to make this dramatic entrance through the walls of the building. Just, uh, just describing that was weird. And when things start getting rough, we get some excellent world building as we connect like the Sniper King with a giant. Not only does this make the giant feel relevant again after like 300 chapters, but it also creates a new cavalry for the second stronger push once the Frankie family starts to lose steam. And it doesn't feel forced. It makes sense that there would be giants in NS Lobby. We've talked about how this place is the stranger part of strangeness. 
it also makes sense that the Giants, after so long, would rebel once they know the truth. And the best part is that Usopp is important here. The one person who wanted to reach Elbath, the land of the warriors, that's Usopp right there. And they're communicating with the Giants to plan this all out. All right, look, I think it's kind of understandable that the crew would all need some kind of upgrade in order to face CP9 and the world government. Maybe if it was like a different genre, you would try to uh, take Robin and just run away. Wait, wait, no, wait, no. That doesn't even make sense uh, th thematically. The Straw Hats have to fight not just to save Robin, but as a declaration of war against the world government because it shows that they are aware of the consequences of their actions and are willing to go through with it anyways. The main villain who, uh, <laughs> look at this outfit. They're a main villain, okay? That's like a bad guy super villain outfit. Uh, the main villain who just straight up tells them that in order to get Robin back, they would have to go up against the world government who are aligned with like over 150 countries. And Luffy, after being told that, after knowing the actual consequences, decides to go through with it anyways, because this is what's valuable. That is why they cannot run away from this fight even if they wanted to. So we knew that they would get power-ups, but I like why they got power-ups for this fight. It's not just them getting stronger for the sake of getting stronger, but instead, as Luffy says, they have to be stronger than everybody else or they'll lose everyone they care about. And so we see Luffy unlock Gear 2, which isn't just like its own unique move, but rather it mimics what CP9 were already doing just in Luffy's own way. It is a creative use of what they already are capable of doing. And we also get like the drawbacks of Luffy's ability where they struggle to sustain themselves because they are just burning so much energy. And so there is almost this uh, built-in punishment system for overusing your ability. On the contrary, for as almost genre shifting as it was, that's also what I like so much about Chopper's Devil Fruit ability. Chopper overdoes it and straight up turns into like a kaiju. They're practically Godzilla. <laughs> Attack on Titan stuff. They destroy uh, practically everything, seemingly without even being consciously aware of their surroundings. They practically just flip a switch and turn into a different creature altogether, making them one of the scariest characters in these fights. Almost everybody during this arc gets some kind of power-up or new way to use their skills, Admittedly, not with all the downsides, like Zoro got a new cutting move, Zanji had the fire leg ability, which also didn't seem to have any drawbacks either, while Nami embraced the, the new baton. Also, I love that this arc isn't totally serious for all of these chapters, like Frankie's uh, just absolutely uh, dumb farting ability, or the long-nosed villain who eats a fruit and turns into a giraffe, and it's weird, and they all gotta stop fighting for a second and be like, wait, hold up, that's weird, you're, you're weird. Okay, so everyone's had their, like, big fight and all, except Luffy, who has been going for all of this time. Luffy's fight has dragged on, but that's kind of the point. Like, near the end, Luffy has ran out of meat, they're out of energy, they can't really even fight any longer. He collapses and is unable to move, which is the pivotal point where Usopp shows up and actually reveals himself as Usopp to encourage and remind Luffy of his role. Luffy is the person who is supposed to take Luchi out. And Usopp isn't really that encouraging. He doesn't really come back and apologize and be really friendly and really nice and start crying about how much they miss each other. They already know that about each other. After this fight, after Ennis Lobby, Luffy and Usopp are already thinking that they're going to go back to their old happy crew like nothing ever happened. Those two already know each other. So forget the apologies, forget the I miss you. This is like the moment where Usopp screams at Luffy to get up and deal with him. And in turn, it's Luffy's moment to prove himself as captain. It is his role to put the burden of others on his shoulders. Yes, Usopp is weak. Yes, he cannot take Luchi on. That is why Luffy has to step up and win. It is pretty tense, especially because... Oh, yeah, I didn't mention this. Uh, this is all happening during a buster call? 
Seriously, the villain, I don't remember their name, they're just like a villain. Since the evil villain practically hit the self-destruct button on himself, it is just madness. We see everybody realizing just how dangerous this Buster Call is and being like, we gotta get out of here. Forget fighting. We just gotta live. Which is practically the same thing the Straw Hats are thinking after some of them just nearly drowned, if not for the conductor who uh, t turns into a mermaid. In hindsight, I guess I... Probably should have expected that. Should I have? Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Tom is from Fishman Island, so I guess it wasn't a big assumption to think that the conductor might be two and that she might be a mermaid. Luffy calls her a monster lady, so I guess that could have just been like a subtle hint to her being a mermaid at all. Either way, it was not on my bingo card. Something else not on my bingo card. Well, I'm doing terribly at this. Something else not on my bingo card was the return of the Going Mary, or the fact that it pleaded with Iceberg to send her on one last journey to save their crew. How even the concept of the Going Mary talking just manages to utterly shock Iceberg. And you know, I get that. I'd feel pretty weird if my home started talking to me too. How it not only just symbolically, but also quite literally brings the crew together, which is how they're even able to escape at this lobby amidst all of the chaos. It's beautiful. And look, I'm not surprised that this is one of the highest ranking arcs because it is heart-wrenching and built off of the past 400 chapters of the story. The weakest character and the ship both crumbling under the intensity of the Grand Line is definitely not a coincidence. And it wouldn't surprise me if this was one of the arcs that were like heavily planned out from the start. Now admittedly, I didn't talk about everything because I originally wanted to also lump Post and this lobby in here too. But after reading like three chapters, I realized that despite it being the quote unquote aftermath, it turns out that the aftermath holds a ton of stuff that made me rethink some of the themes of this arc. So I definitely think I'll talk about it more when I eventually do cover Post and his lobby.